Mm, 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 mm. Okay. And we are back after a while of, of what feels like a while of being gone. We've got another live happening today with Found North. So I'm excited about that. We're going to be talking to Nick Taylor, which is one of the co founders, about what they've got going on with the brand and what to expect from these two new releases coming out, five and six. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good, how are you? My, my, uh, my tripod broke about four minutes ago, right as I was getting set up. <laughs> so oh, I was scrambling no. around getting into, I've got right now I've got the, the, the phone stacked on top of cases with books holding it in plate, you know, it's like, oh God, okay. Well, smart. You're innovative. <laughs> I had to think so, quick on my you know, I'm here for the innovation. That's all we can really ask for. Yes. Well thank you for having me. I'm really yes, excited. I'm excited to do this. So oh, I haven't tried fine. either of the batches yet. I just poured them. Oh baby! I, oh, like to, I like to do it live. Yes, yes. All right. Well, I will do the same. Yes. Do you already have a pour of each? All right. And so both my shipments, actually, little sidebar. Both my shipments had both samples in it. <laughs> Just so you know. Good. That means we sent two samples of of batch five to someone else, which I'll have oh. to feed. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry for that person, but I got two samples of each, so yeah. I'll be holding on to both. Yeah, there you go. That's a win. I'm excited to try these. So while people start to join us as they join us, since we are in the middle of the afternoon, I did want to start essentially from the beginning, because my yeah. introduction to y'all was in batches, I think, three and four. Hmm. Um, cool. So I didn't get a chance, because I think in terms of seal box, that's the only two we've sold previously, so... That's how I got familiar with you all. Uh, yeah. So yeah, let's talk about found. Are you based in the U.S.? Because I know it's Canadian whiskey. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a funny question. Uh, it's an obvious question, right? It's like where are you guys from? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so, you know, we source everything from Canada. Uh, so we okay. source all of the whiskey from Canada. Um, but we have a um, we we have a warehouse where we store. Um, where we store some of the barrels and we do the physical blending in Dover, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. um, but our team is based in Massachusetts and in, in upstate New York. Um, and so we, the interesting thing about starting this, this brand was we actually got our first source of whiskey that we really liked in, I think it was April of 2020. Um, so literally like peak craziness COVID. Yeah, peak um, shutdown. Yeah, peak shutdown. And so we, 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 when we developed batch one, I don't believe that any of us were ever in the same room while we were blending uh, because we were literally just doing it yeah, remotely. Um, and so, you know, before COVID, we had offices here in Massachusetts, um, but then we, we realized after sort of developing the whiskeys and developing the brands, completely virtually that that we really just did um all the work from home um and so you know much to my um <laughs> much to my wife's dislike um <laughs> i do a lot of the blending at my dining room table um i had to we had thanksgiving dinner the other day so i had to clean it off for the first time in like a year and she was like, can we just keep it like this? It's like, oh, come oh, I'm sure she probably Maybe. misses being able to see her dining room table in all its normal glory. <laughs> 300 samples on it, yes. So, so to answer your question, you know, we, we think of Massachusetts as kind of our home market um, yes. because we, we really developed our own, our own careers in whiskey here. Um, but but we're, we're pretty dispersed. Okay, nice. And so how many people founded it? I know you're a co-founder. How many founders in total are there? My brother and I are the are the the co-founders, um, but uh, uh, Sammy and Phil were were on our team at the time when we when we first started developing um, the Found North brand, um, and and they were there they were both there from day one. Sammy Sammy is um, my my sort of partner in blending, 
Um, and, uh, and Phil is our Swiss army knife, um, and is on our, our control team. He does literally yeah, everything he, he from our do AV to tastings to literally anything that needs to get yeah. done. Phil does. Um, he's nice. he kind of the, the, the linchpin that, that we couldn't live without. So that's really the, the makeup <laughs> of the team. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Cool. First of all, the trees and all that in the background I looks so. I know, right? I, I also I had to lock my poor dogs in the, in the bedroom, otherwise they would try to participate with me right now. That's how my cats are, which is why <laughs> I like to do my lives from my office because I am such a softy when it comes to my cats. I don't like putting them away, but at the same time, anywhere that I'm sitting stationary, they feel the need to populate to that area and like get my attention. So I try well, to do it at my yeah. <laughs> So I don't have to be the one to say no and put them away. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So how did you get into the whiskey business in general? Did you start in spirits or even in that realm of hospitality, beverage, any of that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that it's it's kind of a cool part about um about our team, which is all of us started in customer facing roles. Um so I started as a whiskey buyer. For a chain of retailers here in Massachusetts, um, Sammy started as um, first a bartender, but then then was the um, was the the New England uh, brand ambassador for Edrington, um, okay. and then uh, Phil was also a spirits buyer. My brother is the only one who who kind of came out from the from, out of the cold. You know, he he was he had not worked in spirits before, okay. um, but it, but it's actually unusual. Um, you you rarely see people who are starting brands start from the customer side it often starts from the supply side or or um and and i think it it actually is really helpful for us because we've sold so many of other people's whiskeys um and we've yeah. been sort of in touch with what customers that are that have similar palates to us um really like and and what what they're buying and why um and so when we were crafting our our brand and we were and honestly when we were crafting the whiskey we felt like we had a, a um, that we were pretty attuned to both the the priorities and values that that sort of the premium spirits drinkers really really invested in in terms of um, the profile, but but looking for sort of bigger, bolder profile, uh, but also cast strength, nacho filter, natural color. Um, these these even the you know even the uh, the wax top was was kind of a tip tip of the hat to to American whiskey drinkers. So we, we yeah. felt really good about that. Okay. So what what particular were you experiencing with American whiskeys that made you guys look to fill a space to give something different? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I really like that question. Yeah, we, we I think uh, there were a couple things. One was the the there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say an, an oversaturation, but there's a lot of whiskey brands that are MGP, sometimes Heaven Hill, sometimes Barnes, but but really yeah. like a handful of distilleries, a lot of the liquids coming from from yeah. those distilleries. Being sourced from a few, from about a little handful of and places, we, yeah. We love that profile. It's not like we don't like that whiskey, right? It's not an issue yeah. of saying, oh, this whiskey isn't good. It's more of an issue of saying, you know, if this is the flavor profile, if this is the flavor profile of all of those whiskeys, we don't want to be smack dab in the middle of it. Um, yeah. we, we really like the idea of of stretching a little bit and, and making something that is attuned to that palette, but more on the edges of the profile that has a little bit of differentiation um, and and makes people... Um, Makes people go. I like. I really like this, but it's different than the other things that are on my bar. Um, yeah. So that was, that was from a flavor standpoint. That was a that was a big piece of it. Um, from a value standpoint, though, the 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 price of you know four or five year old bourbon and and likewise four or five year old rye has has really gone up a lot in the last yeah. yeah. Um, and and to be able to come out with um, you know our first two whiskeys being 16 year, um, 16 year, and then a 17 year, and then an yeah, 18, and an 18 year. year. Yeah. 
And then even even batch five, which is a, a, a blend of eight and twenty one year, to, to be able to have something that's a majority. Oh, this is a blend of eight and twenty one. Yeah, yeah. Look at so that's say it on there. Look at me and my eyeballs. Yeah. Okay. Twenty seven percent eight year and seventy three percent twenty one year. Um, you know, it's not it's not just the that the age statement matters, which of course, for from a value perspective, consumers look at that. Yeah. Um, sure. But also, it's, there's a there are certain qualities in whiskey that are really only available because of time in a barrel. Um, and so, if you really like exploring with with some unusual notes, um, that requires oxygen. It requires um, not just wood extraction, but mm -hmm. but the oxidative process. Yeah, um, wood interaction. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, for us. Um, being able to being able to, to work with some of these really really good old components um, was a huge driving factor in looking north, um, and and on top of it, and I, I think you know I buried the lead maybe, but on top of it for us, there's something really cool about <laughs> when when we go to Canada and we talk to the the master blenders in in Canada, um, there's a natural question of like. Why? Why aren't you making this whiskey? Um, and and they don't. It's not their style. Um, they don't. They don't. It's not that they can't make this whiskey. It's that they don't really want to. Um, yes. And 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 so for us, the idea of there are these consumers that love a certain style of whiskey, and there's the source that can make it. And we can kind of be have the, no desire to. <laughs> yeah, right. We can we can be the the, the folks the in the bridge. middle that are that are bringing yeah the bridge. We get to, to bring customers to a, a style of whiskey that you know that that is newer to them, and we get to bring a style of whiskey a little bit closer to the consumer. And and when you've worked in the industry, that's one of the most exciting things you can do being being the sort of the revealer, right? The, the person who crack the door open to the vault and you look in and you're like, holy cow, it's there's it. so much cool hey, stuff. Hey, taste this. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I think that was a big factor in it as well. I love that. Okay, well, let's let's start with batch five. Yeah. I like to taste with people because I like to talk things through. But also, let's just talk about the specific, because these are going to be released actually soon. Um, I know we have our shipment coming in from you guys, so we'll be releasing these soon, but we got a blend of 21 and eight year. And I have what really attracts me, which we'll kind of dive into more because you've already touched on it, is the mash. So 73% corn, 27% wheat, which I love high wheat content in whiskeys. Um, it's definitely my jam. So I love a lot of wheat and I love a lot of barley. I'm into rye, but I like rye whiskey as yeah. opposed to like a high rye bourbon. Um, so... Mm. Off the bat, I'm already getting like baked goods, and I don't even know if it's like a croissant or what, but it's like something baked and buttery. I I, I mean, to, I get cinnamon sugar toast. Uh, I, I think it's funny because uh, I think people get often on the nose um, certain flavors are actually very similar to one another. And it's mm -hmm. just kind of what you grew up with. You know what I yeah. mean? So for me, like, it all depends on the memory. that yeah, it's for, you. for me, I, my grandmother used to make us uh, really, she'd butter the hell out of toast with like mm -hmm. Irish butter. And then she, mm -hmm. and then she put a big dollop of cinnamon sugar on top and spread it around. And for me, whiskey that tastes like that is always gives me that, that kind of deep nostalgia. Uh, that's, that's almost like, like if you enjoyed that enough as a child, like if you come across a whiskey like that, it's like it's almost good enough to sit alongside your toast in the morning. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't always condone morning drinking, but this with your butter toast, you can, it can I just be doing it responsibly. <laughs> I almost start every morning with having to taste something. So hey, something. yeah, yeah, exactly. At least I want it to be good. Mm. Mm, yum. <laughs> you can definitely taste the age a little bit, like in a good way. Like the oak presence is there, but it's not super tannic, yep. like some older whiskeys can be. 
And eight, I mean, eight is young, funny. but not young. Not too young, yeah, exactly. Alexa, stop. <laughs> I don't know who invited her to the party. I don't know why she started talking. <laughs> <laughs> she just threw me out. <laughs> mm. I get pepper. Yep. Like that bitiness, that spice is definitely sitting right in the front of my palate. But there's a sweet something here too. I don't know if I want to call it maybe raw honey because it's not, <clears throat> it's definitely not giving sugar sweet. I'm not getting maple. I'm getting more of like, like raw honeycomb. And that's mainly because it's also showing up in texture. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We, we, um, one weird thing that we do is uh, that, that, I feel like it's to me it's always surprising that's unusual in the industry is we actually blend at strength. Um, most blenders I know blend it. They'll proof it down. They'll bring it down to twenty percent uh, because they're blending almost exclusively with their nose, um, yeah. and it's easier to nose, particularly if your if if your goal is more quality control, where you're trying to identify is there a flaw in here, is there something yeah. wrong with the whiskey? Um, yeah. It's much easier to do it at lower proof. Um, and so you'll see most most blenders are doing their blending at 20% so that they can nose everything. And I get it. I understand why they're doing it. But but for us, um, like as it. much as we, as much as we care about the as much as we care about the nose, um, we really care a lot about the um, we care so much about the mouthfeel and the and yeah. the texture. Um, and so when you started saying the, the the sort of raw honey texture, it was like. It's music to my ears because when we made when we made batch I want the whole experience. Yes. It's not just about the nose. I, I, I actually I just learned it's something new today. I didn't know yeah. that a good portion of the blending that takes place is happening based on the nose. Because the nose and the palate can be so deceiving from one another. And I, I part of it I believe is so part of like when I went to I went to Four Roses a few years ago and they were I was in their their quality control lab. And they were in the middle of quality control and they had lined up like 50 different um, batches of, I believe it was just their standard small batch. Mm -hmm. And they were making sure that it wasn't flawed. You can't taste 50 things in a row, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. particularly at strength. And so they're doing it almost exclusively by nose. Um, and so I think for us, the, you know, we have the liberty of doing it at strength because we're only doing such a handful of batches every year, right? Mm -hmm. So we can be, we, we have, we have the, the liver capacity to, to be tasting these things as we're going. Yeah, and you can <laughs> absolutely completely crush your palate, try to do that all by taste, but yeah. I don't know, I guess I just got to stay in a small batch realm then because I, <laughs> I need the smell, I need to taste, I want a texture, but I need totally. all of that to be in my decision-making factors. Um, but that is really interesting. Okay. That makes sense, though. It, it makes sense in a, from a survival standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure you continue to live a long life after you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, can't, I can't knock them for that part. <laughs> now, I won't ask who distills y'all stuff, because that might be a, a contractual thing, and I'll leave that. That is exactly what it is. Yeah. Uh, but so when they when you asked them why they weren't making this particular type of whiskey was it was that question framed around like the type of mass that you guys were asking them to produce for you all more, like, more, I, more stylistically and and more more from a, a strength of a just literally strength perspective uh um, okay. we you know we like we like whiskey i like whiskey I like doing cast strength because I like giving the, the consumer the option to water it down to where they want. I like right? to control for, my dilution. Yeah, for me, for me, I like it. I like I like fifty five percent. The value of one hundred and thirty proof for me is not that I'm necessarily going to drink it at one hundred thirty. If it's great at one hundred thirty, great. I'll drink it at one hundred thirty. Yeah, exactly. But, but for me, like I like having the option of saying, all right, what if I. What if I take this down a little? What if I take it down a little more? Yeah. What happens? You know, that that's what I really care about. And so for us, we, we were we were very insistent on doing stuff at strength. Um, but I think one one thing that that really blows people's mind is is you know 
the Stag Antique Collection. It's not created so that they can sell the Stag Antique Collection. It's created because it creates a halo effect for all of their other whiskeys, right? And it, yeah. it, it helps sell volume. They make Small Batch Limited Edition. They make Four Roses Birthday Bourbon, not because they're like, oh, this is going to be our most profitable thing. In fact, it takes them months to develop those whiskeys. It, it's probably, they're probably doing it at cost, practically. Um, and so the, the reason that they're making that whiskey is it, it creates this halo effect that helps them sell volume of the rest of their products, oh, right? Yeah. Canadian whiskey doesn't need a halo effect because they already sell the U.S. so much volume. Um, Canadian whiskey is the number one selling whiskey in the United States from 1865 until 2010. Really? Yeah. So people think about Canadian whiskey. Uh, you know, you think about rye and you think about Irish whiskey as these booming new categories, right? Yeah. In 2020, rye did something like 1.5 million cases in the United States. Um, Irish did, did a little under 7 million cases. Canadian did a little under 20 million cases. Canadian I didn't realize whiskey. that many people drink Canadian whiskey. I know I like it, but it's and and so much of it is their lower cost products. Um, and and in, in whiskey production, the game is often volume. Um, you know, it's it's often about volume, and so the the super premium whiskeys are often about increasing volume of their other products. Um, and so there's there's not this overarching necessity to really invest all of this time and money into developing the kind of super premium whiskey and the, and, and that, that kind of um, those halo whiskeys that will, that will make Americans pay attention to their, their, you know, volume tier of, of product because they're already doing great with it. <laughs> they sell more Canadian Royal and Canadian club and black velvet. It's I crazy. Saying, I was trying to list off the Canadian brands that I know of and it, I literally can only think of like, Maybe two off the top of my head. Crown was the obvious one. But right, like, Crown's the obvious one. Um, and I know that sells a ton. So I feel okay. like if anybody's carrying the boat over the wave, it's probably Crown Royal. But exactly, that is wow. I know it's wild. Canadian whiskey. That's wild it's to wild. me. Actually, it's wild. it was wild to me. And so I, I think I, there's a there's a, a bit of an attitude of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, they do, they do really well with, um, with things that, you know, that people are pretty happy to, to blend with Coke, you know, crown and Coke crown and, you know, crown and seven. I it's like those at a high, at cash strength. Cause I also appreciate cash strength whiskeys because again, I want to control my dilution, but that also translates over to cocktails. If I want this over a cube, I still want it to taste as great as it does without the cube as it does with the cube and I can't do that sometimes if it's not at like 130 proof or 100 plus proof I can't hold on to those flavors that I get I love from that. It being in its true essence so I love castrate whiskeys and I love the fact that we like I want to say like good 85% of this is we sell probably at cast strength I uh, yeah I can't imagine like I'm not putting an 80 or 90 proof whiskey over a cube <laughs> like, uh, yeah, at I, that point, it's giving splash of it's, water. It's too, thin. <laughs> yeah, it's too thin, right? It loses all its texture. I, I think it loses uh, all it, of its texture. And I'm at that point, I'm just drinking water with a hint of oak. Like, uh, I, water with a hint of oak. I know exactly. Yeah, no, that's that that nails it right on the head. And I, I, I think for us, um, it's funny because I get, I get asked the question all the time, you know, water, should I put ice? You know, should I blend, should I, should I blend your whiskey into a cocktail? And the, the answer is unequivocally oh. yes. You, you, you should do all of the above based on what you want to do. And I, I, I feel like there's a little bit of a, um, a doctrine around like, you know, water's okay, but no ice. And I get it. Look, if I'm, if I'm making a, uh, if I'm, you know, taking notes on a whiskey that I really love or somebody, pours nice something that, yeah. some, somebody, somebody pours me something really rare. Yeah. I'm going to sit down for 20 minutes with my nose in a glass, but a lot of times like, Particularly if it's the summer. I drink whiskey in the summer. If it's the Me summer too. and it's Me 90 too. out. And ice is I, necessary. That's what? I want ice. Yeah. I still want a good whiskey. And yeah. I want something that can, that can maintain that viscosity and that oiliness and that weight. Yeah. Um, even, even when it has yeah. ice. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm with you there. 100%. I completely agree on that. Because I'm not going to sit on a hot-ass rooftop 
with the whiskey most likely. <laughs> so well, yeah, I have the really option to go to Cube and be able to nurse it a little bit. I spent I spent two summers in DC in in mm -hmm. college and summer in DC. Oh, what college did you go to? I went to Davidson, but I did I did a program down in North Carolina. But I did a program uh, two two different summers that brought me up to uh, up to Washington DC. Oh, nice! So, what you study in school that brought you up here for a couple summers? Political science and history. <laughs> Perfect place to study that. All right. <laughs> Honestly, I think I think history was was. Uh, one of the main reasons that I that I was so drawn to whiskey, it had such a rich, um, it, it to me whiskey, the whiskey category is almost alive. It it is this kind of living, breathing, evolving thing, and like and when you like wine, yeah, it's yeah a absolutely wine for me. Yeah, and so I, I I I think one of the things I've always loved, and you know, we get asked the question like, are you guys going to build a distillery? Um, and I wouldn't rule it out, but it's it's not it's not as interesting to me because <laughs> one of the things I love about whiskey is also one of the things that's so daunting about it, which is if you build a distillery and you want to make twenty year old whiskey and it takes you five to ten years to figure out what you're doing, it's a thirty year project, and I don't want yeah. to be making my best whiskey in my waning days. I want to make my best whiskey right now, uh, yeah. and that that's one of the things that I think is. I think is really cool about is actually really cool about Canadian whiskey is it's designed to be blended in the sense that they do these individual components, right? So rather than, you know, the reason we can make a, a whiskey that's, that's 27% eight year and 73% 21 year mm -hmm. is because they distill and mature the corn separately from the wheat. Um, mm -hmm. And their whole attitude is, the, so they the, don't put the, them in the same mash bill. They don't ferment no. together. Right. And so their, their uh -huh. whole attitude is uh -huh. let's create the building uh -huh. blocks that blend. Let's create, let's create the, they say it all the time, right? It's like the distillation process is here's our palette that we're going to create all the paints. And then the master blender's job is to actually paint the picture. Make them, makes sense. Yeah. And, and I think when, when you source from the U.S., some folks, you know, Barrel is doing an incredible job of blending, um, and mm -hmm. some folks are are really focusing on blending. We we look at High West as a great example, um, mm -hmm. where they created the Rendezvous and originally was like six and sixteen year blended together. Um, you know that that's cool, but it's it's difficult with American whiskey because they've effectively completed the whiskey during the during the the mashing, fermenting, distilling, and aging yeah. process. You're usually buying essentially a finished product. In Canada, we're buying paints, and then we're actually you're blending buying together. corn whiskey. You're buying wheat. Right. Buying, buying wheat. Buying whiskey. Exactly. exactly. You're getting a, essentially like a Canadian single malt if you're sourcing like their barley. Barley. Yeah, exactly. And so, wow. I would love to know what a Canadian single malt whiskey tastes like, actually. No, that, that's actually it's – a, it's a great question. And I, I think um, – one of the, the sort of learning, uh, one of the learning processes for us was when we first started blending, we assumed that the best tasting whiskeys would make the best blends. Um, yeah, that's not necessarily the case. That, like, that much I do know. It's really not. It's really not a good the thing could go wrong. Yeah, and 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 really, what's what's tricky is if you take a, if you take complete whiskeys that are really balanced and done, and you put them together. It gets really muddled. It, it can get really muddled really quickly. Um, it's actually really useful to have these whiskeys that have great spice notes, but are actually missing some body. And then you take a whiskey that's got great body, that's a little quiet on the nose and a really a little quiet on the top notes. And when you bring them together, you get a much better whiskey than if you take something that's got a little bit of everything and you kind of jam them together. It doesn't. It doesn't really that give, yeah. That's actually more of a single barrel. In that case, yeah. if it's already I, I got the mesh of what you need. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Ooh, okay, that's really cool. Let's taste the second one. Let's taste batch six. Taste the second one. Yeah, he wants some, wants some more of that maple syrup, then here we go. I was going to say, already <laughs> it's giving more of maple syrup, more like roasted, not roasted coffee, but just something roasted in that, that smokiness that's kind of there. Yeah, yeah. so this is, a, this is a five whiskey blend. The, the whiskeys are range from um, 
17 to 26 years old. Ah, okay. So we've got 87% corn, 12% rye, and 1% malted barley this time. We, we don't mix the, um, the, the, we don't actually put the barley in. So this is a little confusing aspect of, of the process, which okay. is sometimes the Canadians use. So basically the big difference between American whiskey and Canadian whiskey is um, when the U.S. in the early 20th century was, was really defining how you could make bourbon, what, what mm -hmm. you could define as whiskey, and they were basically instituting all of these very strict regulations. Mm -hmm. um, they were narrowing what you can do um, meanwhile, Canadian whiskey was actually broadening what you Expanding could do. Expanding what you could do, and, yeah. And one of, the, one of the big things they decided was we can actually cultivate enzymes, um, and then we don't need to put barley into everything. Uh, because yeah. barley is in the mash bill, most, not from a flavor standpoint, it's in, it's it in the mash bill. the yeast and all that, yeah. Exactly, because it helps convert starch to sugar. And so the, the Canadians started, to, to started cultivating enzymes, and, and started taking barley out. Um, that being said, sometimes in their rye, they'll still put a fraction of barley in there. Um, they like okay. the natural enzymes. So the-, so the percent you, is actually what they're including in the mash with their rye. So, so when, you see, when you see our blends and it says, you know, 4% barley or 1% barley or whatever that barley is, we're actually extrapolating based off of what the barley content was in the rye in component. In the rye. Yeah. Nice. Okay, see these are little nuggets I love to find out. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. And I still get that, so the, the spice on the nose is more muted in this one. I definitely get more of that sweet up front. Mm -hmm. mm, that maple's nice. And it's not it's not exactly giving me like dark, rich maple. It's kind of leaning more towards like an amber, like lighter grade of maple because it's not it's not overwhelming my nose with I think it ends up. Um, I think it ends up showing almost a molasses note on the palate, um, mm -hmm. and that the 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 um, the really old component in there, the twenty six year, is is actually aged in Hungarian oak. We love. That's where the Hungarian, Hungarian oak part comes in. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's aged in Hungarian oak. Hungarian oak um, wow. is like we love Hungarian oak. Hey, Hungarian oak is tighter grained but has just as much wood sugar. So it ends up giving this, like, the, the, the sort of caramel notes that you're used to, that you're used to from New Black American. American oak. White oak, yeah. They, they kind of get a little, like, sultry. <laughs> they get, like, a little heavy and a little sultry sweaty. Sultry is little such dark. an accurate word for what I'm experiencing right now. <laughs> That's very accurate. There's a, there's a, it's, like, next level in terms of, like, the richness I definitely get more tannins from the from the higher age. If we had to com compare or really contrast like Hungarian oak and what that would impart on the whiskey versus like a French oak. We all know what American American white oak is, is going to impart on it. We get the caramelizations and the vanillas and the tobaccos and all that. Yeah. And then we also know that we get a lot more dryness, a lot more tannins, more peppery, kind of spicier from a French oak. Yeah. What yeah. kind of influence does the Hungarian oak in part that would like kind of take it away from some of these other barrels? All spice. Um, yeah, I, it, it takes. I, I think of, um, um, you know, I, I, if you've had the, if you've had the, uh, which I'm sure you have, the the Westland Gariana, Gariana oak has that ha, has that almost that like barbecue effect, and so your mm. kind of phenolic notes turn into kind of a almost like mesquite. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Hungarian oak barrels have a similar effect where your, your bright sugars go to molasses, your baking spices get a little heavier and they go to more like allspice. Um, your, your vanillins and your caramels go to maple. Um, I, I, for some reason I always think of, um, and, and this comes up when we're blending, I always think of notes on, on sort of a scale, um, top notes to heavy notes your, your top yep. notes being more your kind of like bright floral really really kind of uh, fresh verdant notes and your yeah. heaviest notes being kind of your syrupy weighty um um just just uh, uh heavier notes and i would I say like, like when you when you think yeah so when you think of what american oak does if american oak gives you some 
some kind of cherry, you, you get more like a caramelized stone fruit from, from your, from your, uh, uh, uh when you get kind of this, this sort of, if you get your, your maple syrup, I mean, sorry, your, your caramel notes that kind of become a little darker, a little heavier, a little more maple syrupy. Um, and so it just takes everything and it kind of grounds it and makes it a little earthier and a little sweeter, a little richer. Oh, I like that. Ooh, I like that. I would have someone say, I love what you guys are doing. Such fantastic flavors and mouthfeel. Thanks, Louder. Thank you. Mm. I'm not a person that automatically likes a whiskey more just because it's older. Yeah. But between these two, in terms of the flavor profile that I lean to and the type of notes that I lean to, like I lean into the roasted. The, those heavier, more weighty type of notes. They just speak to myself for some reason. Though I also can appreciate the lighter, brighter, more citrus forward, maybe floral, those type of things too. I appreciate the whole damn scale. Really. The whole but, yeah, yeah. The whole thing. <laughs> but I really do like this batch six a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think for us, the, the really interesting thing was um, when we first started, we made batch one and batch two. Batch one was a rye. Batch two was supposed to be a rye. When we first started, we were going to make rye. Um, that, that was like our, where our headspace was. Um, but as we blended batch two with these corn components that we were getting, mm -hmm. we started finding these really interesting whiskeys when we tilted the scale to favor the corn versus the rye. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had to have a meeting with batch two because it started as a rye, but we kept tweaking the blend. And all of a sudden we were at like 60, 40 corn to rye. And we were like, uh-oh, no uh -oh. We, need rye, to, we need to have a meeting here. Uh, can't call it bourbon. It's, it's not a rye. Like, we don't even know how to categorize this whiskey. Yeah. Um, and so, we, and, and on top of it, we were like, will people really buy something that is not, doesn't fit neatly in a box? Um, will people buy something that, that isn't easily categorizable um, and familiar? And we weren't sure, but we, we felt confident when we made it at 80% corn, 20% rye. We were pretty confident that that we could that that we could pour it for people and they they'd like it. We'd eventually sell out, and then of course, everybody loved batch two. Like people went nuts about batch two, so we kind of recreated it with batch four, but but a different iteration. And batch six is so the evens have kind of just each is been batch in four one the iteration. One that y'all are considering the rye whiskey or is that batch three? Batch three was the rye. So we did batch one with the rye. Batch three was the rye. And then batch five was a whole new thing. And okay. then it was two, four, and six were all these sort of high corn component, minority grain rye, like keep, keep it almost like a bourbon mash bill. So um, I don't know if you're allowed to tell me this because I know some stuff that is, is under wraps in terms of yeah, I can tell uh, you information, I but um, with you guys' yeast choices, are you doing ambient yeast? Like is it is it some wild grown yeast in, in Canada or are they – keeping it consistent with you. That, that's proprietary. Oh, they, when won't, we they won't even tell y'all. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of info that, that we want that, they, that they're required not to tell us. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We, we, I think the funniest thing was, we, you know, the, the bottle has this, like, topographical map on it. It's hard yeah. to see it on Instagram Live. But, but it has this, this topographical map. And, and we, we really wanted to do it as the – we wanted to use the, the distillery that we bought the first the, the first components from mm -hmm. and they wouldn't even let us do that because if they were like yeah someone will figure it out someone will match the map oh, they don't want to be, yeah, people be able to kind of pinpoint where yep, well, yeah because if there's only been so many distilleries in an area then there, somebody's I mean, gonna narrow honestly, it down if you if you if you dug into Canadian distilleries, you quickly figure out that it could only be a handful of distilleries that are old yeah. enough that are making the, you know what I mean? And so really it wouldn't be that hard if we started giving away Easter eggs to pinpoint where it is. Yeah. And I understand, I understand the mentality, which is like, they need to, they don't know what we're going to do with the whiskey and they don't know how it will be received. Yeah. So if we make crappy whiskey, maintain... They got to protect the reputation of everything they're making. So I get why they do it. It's just a bummer because we'd love to be able to say, "Hey, like you know, sing their praises about it." Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. We'd love to tip the hat at the at the at the distillers and the blenders who are who are working on these things in 
up in Canada because we do think they're making an incredible product up there. Yeah, but we're yeah. happy to keep blending it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So do you all source from just one distillery at this point or well, has it changed per batch? It's it started to change. Yeah, okay. we've started to actually additionally we've started to do um we've started to, to take a little bit more control in terms of we're actually recasting components now. Um okay. And, mm, and it, it, it's like doing some finishes and then blending from there. Yeah, and and the reason when, the the reason it is because um, when we first started, if you have fifteen different samples you're working from and you can blend any number of them together at any ratio, there's there's basically an infinite possibility, right? And you get this sense of like we can make anything, but it's not really true because if you think about it as your spice cabinet right? Mm -hmm. If you have all these different spices, just because you can make things doesn't mean they'll actually mean taste good. Yeah. Only some of them actually, at, at only some of them blend together at certain ratios. I like to say like, look, if you have garlic, you know, blueberries and chocolate, like the garlic's useless. You're just going to figure out how to blend to work with, right. You really only have two things. And those two things really only work at a certain ratio. Um, yeah. So as much as there is truly infinite possibilities, um, there are only so many that, that work well. And so to keep exploring and keep experimenting and keep creating new batches, because we really don't want to just remake the same thing, um, we've actually had to start taking some of the components and recasting them and diversifying our, our, our palette, our paint palette, so we can paint new pictures. Oh, okay, fine. So, so will every batch at least for the foreseeable future be different there there's we we have we've talked about making um some some more readily available product that people could can always be able to find yeah some sort of um, we, we haven't developed it yet and and part of that is one of the one of the cool things about sourcing whiskey for us is we can really pick up three or four barrels at a time we can really buy just a just a small lot of whiskey that's doing some unique thing. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult to recreate that, <laughs> yeah. you know, with, without controlling the distillation process. It's very hard to recreate that. And so, what we don't want to do is come out with a flagship that isn't consistent. Um, so, you know, if we could develop a whiskey where we were really able to regularly produce it, mm -hmm. I, I think we'd be willing and probably happy to do that, so that customers could go in and say. I like drinking my found north small so batch the, or whatever yeah. you call it, right? Um, but at the same time, we, we really enjoy, um, and we think the consumer enjoys both the ephemerality of it, right? The idea that, hey, when batch two is gone, it's gone. When batch four is gone, it's gone. Um, and there's, there's something, you know, there's something really neat. It's, it's when you're a whiskey collector, um, and, and that doesn't mean you're, you're, you know, you, you have to have this massive cabinet of whiskey, but when you're yeah. somebody who really values a whiskey, yeah. um, there's something really beautiful about deciding like, now is the moment when I'm going to drink a little bit of this, knowing that when this bottle is empty, there's, there's none of it left in the world. Um, I, I, I get really romantic about that. For me, it, it me feels too. like, I, it feels like life, right? It's like this, mm -hmm. it's life is a bunch of moments and, and whiskey is about enhancing those moments. And, Having so something that, about a time and place also same with totally. wine for me. So yeah. I have a huge appreciation for both wine and whiskey for that fact that it directly speaks to a time and place. And 100%. so I am, I, I will call myself a collector as opposed to hoarder because I do hoard bottles. But <laughs> I definitely am one of those people who, are, if I, especially if I love it, I almost <laughs> never finish it. I have to hold on to some piece of it. Yeah, I have a little of it. Yeah, so yeah, I, I like think... the, there's certain bottles I'm like, okay, when I have a kid, I can't wait till they like get married. <laughs> and we're like sitting around sipping something. Like when they turn 21, that first crack. <laughs> like I'm thinking about all that stuff and like collecting them for these type of like experiences. So I definitely, I like that. I have a, I, love I have a bottle. Matches aren't the same. Totally. I have a bottle that I've been hoarding for, for eight years that I'm waiting to open for a, a special occasion for my brother. Mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah. uh, I'm big on that. Yeah, I've been set, it's been hiding in the cabinet for, for years, almost a decade. Uh, yeah, I totally get that. And I, and I think for us, like, um, 
you know, the beauty of doing the batches is the beauty of doing the batches is, is you get to recreate that every time, you know, every time we're making a whiskey that you can't find again. And that's exciting, you know, and I, I think, find I think it that's, again. yeah, totally. And, and I think there's, there's also a, um, in a way there's an ongoing story. Uh, when we made batch two, we intentionally made batch four to, to be an evolution of it. Not the same thing, but, but to almost be like, like a riff off of batch two. And when we made batch six, batch six was a riff off of batch four. We said, yeah. okay, you like this about this one. We know you like that. So we, we took it and we stretched it a little this way. Further. And then we stretched exactly. it and took and it a little bit. I like approaches right? like that too. It, it's like yeah. a journey, right? You know, yeah. you're, you're really, and, I, and our, you know, our, our ethos, our branding, everything is about that, that sort of the nature of exploration that is whiskey. Um, and I think that's part of why the, the batches are really fun. And we, I, you know, we, we care a lot about feedback. When we hear consumers saying, this is what I loved about batch two, I wish it was a little bit more this, we try to make that. We try to make that with the next batch. When we hear that, that feedback about batch four, we try to make that with batch six. Yeah. And that, that gives it almost this feeling of, um, there's, our favorite thing is when somebody sends us a picture of batch one, two, three, four, five, six, all lined up. Yeah. Right? It's like, yeah. we love the idea that you've been on the journey with us this whole time. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we want you to know we're, we're listening. We, we, we love the feedback. We listen to it. And our blending is based off of, of course, what we love, but it's also based off of what we think people want to see next. Yeah, for sure. We had someone say batch four is really great. Yay. <laughs> I agree. Uh, oh, so uh, the bourbon whiskey library said, but the thrill to share with folks usually outweighs that same feeling for me. I agree. In terms of outweighing the feeling to like hold on to it and hoard it. I give myself a few pours to share. Yeah. With those who I know will really appreciate it. And then I close it up and I put it away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I All have right, my first sure like, week or two of excitement of like, okay, you have to try this because I can't be the only one to experience this here. And then after that, it's closed up. I can't say I never let you try. <laughs> let, let, all right. Let me share. I'll share one funny story with you. I, I um, one of the first, I, I started as a, as a scotch hound. Uh, my, my career in whiskey started with a, with a trip to Scotland. I did 40 distilleries in 30 days, just oh hitchhiking God. Scotland. It was really fun. And um, one of the whiskeys that I always wanted to try was Rosebank, which of course was a closed distillery. And um, when in 2014, when the Rosebank 21 year, the last one they made came out um, from Diageo, I hunted down a bottle. I bought it. I called a friend who's a really serious whiskey drinker. And I was like, I found it. You need to come over and have it right now. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's like, hey, I'm in the car with, with my friend James. And I was like, well, does James drink whiskey? And he was like, yeah, drink. I, I, I'm like, I, I hear in the background. It's like, James, you drink whiskey? He's like, yeah, I drink whiskey. And I was like, all right, well, bring James. Oh, James, come see, James Responso had me convinced. Like, are you <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> I pour three rocks glasses with two fat fingers of, of mm -hmm. you know, 55.4% Rosebank 21 in them. Yeah. And, and I'm talking about, I'm, I'm waxing rhapsodic about these, this whiskey, you know. I'm talking to my friend about it. And, and the three of us cheers. And my buddy, I look him in the eye, and I take a little sip. And he's looking at me, and he takes a sip. And out of the corner of my eye, I see James go, boom. <laughs> and, of course, anybody who shoots Rosebank 21 probably doesn't drink cast-strength whiskey. And yeah, so it's 55.4%. And so I look over at him. He's got, like, a, a tear coming out of his eye, you know. And he just looks at me, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, why would you ever just throw back a shot? <laughs> oh, James. So I, I became I became a little more judicious about who I opened my really special bottles with. And that's why you have to vet the people. Because you can say all day, oh yeah, I drink that when you say that yeah, I drink it. No, you don't. No, you don't. 
not with you answering like that, you know. And he proved it. Oh, that's so funny. I know his chest was in pain. It had to oh, be man. for like at least five seconds. <laughs> no, just the, the smooth. I mean, it was just so funny. It was so perfect. I, lo- I was looking at him like. <laughs> <laughs> and when you throw it back like that, you can't even say that you really tasted it. Like. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's fun. Oh, it was God. Fun. Well, James, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love him to death. <laughs> Oh, God, that's crazy. Oh, God, I'm trying to think. Okay, you've answered all of my nerdy questions. This batch six is amazing. Thank you. Mm. You said batch three is arrived, right? Batch three is arrived, yeah. And batch one was right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, did a, um, and then- we, did a, we did a single barrel program. Um, mm-hmm. We created our, our, our first single barrels, which was tricky um, mm-hmm. because – I, I, most, I think most American drinkers would think of it as a double oaked. Um, but the thing is, mm-hmm. like, we, we can't, <laughs> when we're making single barrels, we can't just take a component whiskey and bottle it up. It won't taste right. You know, one of these 100% corns, it just, it won't taste right. One of these 100% yeah. rye. Right. And, and so we really wanted a, we really wanted a single barrel program. Um, and we really wanted to capture that, that, mystique of like this is a one of one there's mm-hmm. there's really not another barrel like this mm-hmm. um so what we did was we blended 12 year rye with 19 year rye with 21 year old corn um we blended them together and then we actually recast it into 18 different barrels and we further matured those barrels oh, all different types of barrels it. and then we sold that as, as we've sold those as single barrels um, okay and and the cool thing about it is uh the cool thing about it is they, the, the, there's, there's no, you can't go buy the regular version of our single barrel. It doesn't yeah. exist, um, which is really fun. Um, and because we did that as a rye this past year, um, we felt comfortable doing batch five and six as both corn base. Um, and that's why we didn't do okay. batch five as another rye. Okay, well, you kind of answered two questions in one for me because one of them yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, is are you guys introducing single barrels, but you already have. So that's cool. And I actually like, I like the approach to blending coming from like an all corn distillate and all rye distillate and, and yeah. combining them that way. I think combining them then in an, in another barrel is, a, is again, another cool way to go about approaching that. So that's It was super dope. fun. It was much more, t- honestly, it was, it was so much more challenging. Because when you're blending to finish something, to, I, and I don't mean finish it as in put it into finishing barrels. I, I mean, when you're blending a batch and, you, and when you're done with the blend, yeah. it tastes exactly like your test blend. That's yeah. easier because you say, okay, I can tweak it. Do I want it to be a little sweeter? Do I want it to be a little mm-hmm. spicier? Do I want it to be a little oilier? I can, mm-hmm. I can maneuver these different components until I get exactly where I want. Yeah. When we were creating the blend to be recast, um, the way we describe it is it needed space for wood. We needed to kind of develop everything, but then anticipate what wood would do. Would do we didn't to want, it, yeah. Right, exactly. We didn't want to make a done whiskey and then recast a done whiskey. It, mm-hmm. it, it, would, it would fall out of balance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was do, creating a blend that would take a bunch of different cast types in positive directions was was tricky but then the harder part is when you're tasting the when you're tasting the single barrels they they don't necessarily age linearly it's not like oh it's getting a little spicier and it's getting a little more wood it's just going to keep doing that it goes all over the place and so when you're deciding whether it's time to bottle it or not you also can't go backwards. You know, ah, I liked it better a month ago. I'm going to go back and, yeah. and bottle. You know, you're like, oh, we screwed up. You know, so it's so. And and then of course you have to decide: is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? Yeah, because I was just about to say, how do y'all make that decision to, when you get to that point? How do y'all make that decision? Like, well, let's give it a little more time and see if it kind of takes us into a, rec- a direction we're fine with versus let's pull it before it possibly gets worse. Sometimes we make that decision, um, but the nice thing about selling the barrels to clubs and stores and accounts and, and uh, different places is 
a lot of times we leave that, that decision up to the customer. They taste it. They say, I love it. How it is. We go, great. Let's bottle it. Great. You know, that, and, and by keeping it in the wood. That being said, sometimes we, um, we started in, we, you, you can see a trend or you start anticipating, um, particularly one really interesting complication with with doing further maturations is the previous spirit has interacted with the wood differently than the new spirit will right so what i mean by that is if you have a spirit cask so if you have like an x cognac or an x calvados or an x um whiskey cask or something like that um you will have had there will have been at 60%, 55%, which means the interaction between the wood and the liquid is a lot of ethanolysis, right? Mm -hmm. Ethanol interacting with the wood. Mm -hmm. When you finish in wine casks, the previous spirit has been predominantly water, right? You have something that's like 12 or 14% alcohol by volume. The interaction with the wood is actually water. Mm -hmm. And water reacts with, with the wood very, very differently very than... Differently alcohol interacts with the wood in that case you've had a lot of hydrolysis Is that hydrolysis ethanolysis hydrolysis yes and so in essence when we were taking the liquid and putting it into the wine barrels we were seeing it go everywhere mm -hmm. when we were putting it into the whiskey or the calvados or the armagnac or the cognac or whatever the the different barrel was that was previously a spirit it was much more of a linear progression um, and so with, with some of the wine barrels, when we found that it was at a great spot, we, we were just Pulled like, it. it doesn't matter if anybody's bought it yet. Yeah, we're, it. we're not going to let it get drier. We're not going to let it go in any other direction. It's been too unpredictable. We're yeah. ready. Bottle it up. Let's pull it. Um, and so the, the, that, was, that was a lot of the thinking. And, and the other piece was you want your single barrels to, to be – to have defining characteristics. Um, so when we had a barrel that was doing something really pronounced that we really loved, um, the first single barrel we did was, it just tasted like a marshmallow s'more graham cracker, just so delicious. And we were like, we don't want this to go anywhere else because this yeah. is so identifiable and delicious. Let's pull it. So Do that I was our- more of that left? I I'll send you a bottle. I was going to say that, especially after I just spent Thanksgiving in a cabin eating almost nothing but s'mores. That sounds amazing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, we've got like, I, I, I have a personal case of it. Mm. Uh, so I'll send you one of my boxes. Oh, I'll be forever in your debt. I'll trade you for a soapbox <laughs> private reserve. Yes, you yeah. Okay. Yes, we've got fun ones. Oh, I know. Cool. We've been following the steel box forever. <laughs> we are I'm big so fans. glad we finally figured out how to how to work together. This is so great. <laughs> then I definitely want to. Um, I'm. Sure, I don't know. If Blake has already even thrown anything out there like that because we are very much into the single barrels and or, but especially how you guys approach single barrels is very different from how single barrels that we've of course have acquired up until now, um, have been done. So, I'm excited to taste through what that actually that what that experience is like because it's i know it's we, different we we have a yeah so we've we've been spitballing with blake briefly mm -hmm. um but but we have we have some ideas for we have some really fun ideas for steel box. yeah i can yeah. i can imagine if he's we'll talked to y'all about your process already that his wheels are already spinning <laughs> so uh, i have some th i have i i have some thoughts i have some when we do the next live my hope yes. is that that we will have executed a special release with Sealbox that I have had just mm -hmm. brewing. As my as my wife would say, I, I have, have you been noodling? I've been noodling all day about this idea. Noodling, I like it. <laughs> what is the origin of their older expressions? Like the seventeen eighteen year hoods on. Hey Jack, um, ask what the origin of the older expressions are. Like the eighteen and I presume it's the distillery. So I guess origin is you talking? Are you talking referring to like where yeah. it's coming from? Yeah, they, they, so they won't send us. They won't even send you samples until you sign an NDA. Yeah. Um, so to answer that, fine. Jack, there's a lot they can't say about the origin I, I, of we, things. We tried to. It's actually really funny when we when we made the first um, when we made the the first blend and we were doing the label. Mm -hmm. We put all the different whiskeys that were in there with all the different maturations. And it, it 
it was the messiest, ugliest <laughs> label you've ever seen. Uh, yeah. So we shortened it, and we put as much information as we can on the on the uh, on the label without getting a little too, um, uh, you know, a, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the website will the the website the description so far whiskeys we say pretty much everything we we can. You all and you guys, well, you already answered this because you can't, you couldn't put the actual, um, what is it called, top, the topography or yeah, you know, yeah, the topography. No. So you guys aren't allowed to share geographical. We can't, we can't, we can't even give hints. Um, yeah. we can't. So like, we can't yeah, I'm not allowed to tell you all that. I know. I know. The same it's reason a that a lot of these Kentucky distilleries that are contracting out their juice aren't allowing people to share where they're getting their juice from. Same reason. So. Same thing. Yeah. They are also very protective of their reputations in Canada. Not I see the geographic location of this game. I, I honestly, if we if we said if we gave even a hint geographically, it would probably give it away. We breach the yeah. We're not breaching yeah. no contract yeah. today. We're gonna keep that intact. We keep that intact. <laughs> we're gonna hold on to that. It, it is it is really hard. I, I've been on the phone with. Um, I was on the phone with uh, Lou Bryson, uh, and and he he writes the he wrote uh, Tasting Whiskey, which I think is just like anybody who's trying to get into whiskey and wants to get like really the basics in a great way. Tasting Whiskey is my I've read I've read through three copies of it to the point where they've all fallen apart. Uh, and I was talking to him about it, and he just he was like, "It's this place, right?" And I'm just sitting there like. Can't tell you, sir. <laughs> I want to tell you. I want to tell you. Oh, oh, that was why Jack was skeptical at first. Well, you're a Leo. You're a born skeptic like me. But um, <laughs> I can tell you personally that it's delicious. So if you were feeling intrigued about trying it, I recommend trying it, Jack. Sorry, I want to make sure I'm not plugging up my devices. Things are dying around me. Okay. Um, but no, Jack, it's delicious. It's worth trying. We have it at Sealbox. I don't talk about shit that I don't actually like, so you can at least trust that much. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I uh, I don't believe in saying unnice things, but I do believe in silence when I don't have anything nice to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did uh, I did a lot of I did a lot a lot of things when I was a uh, whiskey buyer. One of mm -hmm. the big things I like to do is like, and and I remember when when we'd have a whiskey, when we'd have a, a representative of a, a brand of whiskey in, and the customers didn't like the whiskey. It was amazing. What do you guys think? Crickets. Nobody was going to come up and be like, "Oh, I'm ripping it to shreds." I'll say that. <laughs> they're not going to. They're not going to like lay into it. But I, I know. I know what you're talking about. You just sit yeah. there like. Uh, so I've been holding you for an hour, so I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but okay. I want to close out with one question. Yes. Yeah, in this process now, because you started, you said in 2020? We started developing in 2020. We released the first whiskeys April 2021. Okay. So in that process, that's a really short process, actually. You guys have cranked out a nice amount of batches over the past two years. So what have you learned so far in this process that you'll forever take with you? And what did you learn in this process that, like, what did you learn that's something you will, like, do away with and something you'll always keep with you? I think from a, from purely a whiskey standpoint, mm -hmm. um, I, I think a, a do away with was when we first started blending, yeah, I, I, it felt like I was trying to match flavors. You know, you'd be like, oh, okay, this tastes like stone fruit and stone fruit goes well with this. Okay. And, and it's total nonsense. Mm -hmm. you're, you're really what you're trying to do is it's kind of you're not apricot to, with baking spices. Yeah. Like, it's just, that's, it's crap. It's total yeah. nonsense. And, and I'm not saying the tasting notes are nonsense. I take, I write all our tasting notes and I believe mm -hmm. them. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but uh, likewise, but, I do too. <laughs> right? Like I, I don't, I, I'm not just blathering out random stuff. I, I taste it. That's what I taste. Mm -hmm. But when you're developing a blend, it, it's much more, um, for me, there's, there's much more of, it's a really beautiful experience in terms of like, in a way you're shaping the whiskey, but in a way you're kind of just following it. Um, you're, you're, you're like, you're putting things together because 
you want a little bit more fat or you want a little more sweetness or you want a little bit more viscosity, you want a little bit more tannin, these really basic things that you're trying to do and you're crafting it and it doesn't behave. One plus one doesn't equal two with blending. You know, it's one of those things where one plus one suddenly equals five or it equals negative three. I mean, it it goes all over the place. And so you're in a way there's this, there's this really lovely uh, balance between I'm trying to shape this whiskey, um, but but there's but it's a little bit of like yin and yang. There's a little bit of you're directing it, and there's a little bit of you're, you're letting it kind of take you. Yeah, yeah. You let you're letting it, it kind of take you where it's taking you. Um, so so I would I would say from a um, from a purely whiskey standpoint, the thing that I really did away with was this notion of trying to match specific flavors. Okay. Um, and the thing I was really trying to embrace from a whiskey standpoint was, um, was, was a little bit surrendering to the process and just being like, this is going to take time. There's, and you're going to have these aha moments. Um, and, and then I, I think from a, from more of a, a bigger picture standpoint, um, I think, I think the, the thing that, that, I have done away with is I really I didn't have as much faith in the consumer to be an explorer with us as I've discovered is the truth Um, not eloquent but basically like the the I I really I thought that um, the consumer would be a little bit more dogmatic about I drink this and this is what I drink Mm -hmm. and I think that was my experience more maybe seven or eight years ago when I started, people were really, I only drink single malt. I only drink bourbon. I only drink, you know, it was like, yeah. this is my category. And people have been much more open to, if you're honest about the process and transparent about what you're doing and your ethos matches my ethos, then I'm willing to drink it. I don't care if it's Canadian. I don't care if it's rum. I don't care if it's rum. Yeah. I will give it a try. I'm, I'm going to embrace that. And I think that's really, I think that's been really, really cool. And I would say the thing I've embraced the most is working with good people. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a startup, when you're a startup, people say, you know, you just say yes to everything. Um, and, and, and I think I don't care about the, I really don't care as much about the good business sense as I care about working with people who I respect and really enjoy working with every day. And, and this industry is just full of wonderful people at honestly, like working with you, working with Blake, like that, that to me is what's really meaningful and special about starting your own brand is getting the opportunity to work with good people. Yeah. I I definitely agree with you on that. Yes. Well, that's a great, that's a great note to cheers on. I love it. Yeah. Cheers. That's a great combo, Nick. Thanks for joining me. Thank, no, thank you. Thanks for having me. It didn't yeah, even thanks. feel like an hour. I know, I know. It rolls by. It was that awesome. Was really fast. So I am finishing the last of my batch six, y'all, because this is my favorite so far. Oh, there we go. Cheers. I'm really enjoying this a lot. So, Jack, I'll be looking out for your order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so these will be uh, releasing soon. Obviously, just keep an eye on our Instagram for that. We'll post about it, of course. There will also, of course, be an email slash text. Um, y'all know how we do so keep an eye out thank you Nick found North is fab cannot wait to try some special finishes and single barrels in this amazing s'more situation so I will follow up with you about offline (laughs) have a great rest of your Thursday I appreciate it you too thanks for having me cheers guys bye